Hey guys, just wanted to come in and say I'm really sorry for the delay in this episode. Uh, there's several problems with it. We've been working really hard on trying to fix it. Also, my life has been really, really busy. Uh, the first problem you may find is my uh, voice is kind of echoey, while Sean's is normal. Sorry about that. That was a problem on my part. Also, the second problem is sometimes the audio loses sync. I'm trying to figure out why this happened. I'm not quite sure but we'll fix it for future episodes. Thanks. Enjoy. I killed those people. That's what I can be. No, no, you can't. You're not. I'm whatever God of needs me to be. Go in. A hero. Not the hero we deserved, but the hero we needed. Nothing less than a knight. Shining. I'll hunt you. You'll hunt me. You'll condemn me. Set the dogs on me. Because that's what needs to happen. Because sometimes truth isn't good enough. Sometimes people deserve more. We have to chase him. Okay, we're going in. Go, go! Move! He didn't do anything wrong. Because he's the hero Gotham deserves. But not the one it needs right now. So we'll hunt him. Because he can take it. He's not our hero. He's a silent guardian. A watchful protector. A dark knight. And welcome to Nick's Bad Podcast. I'm here with Zach Martin. Hello, and myself, Sean Barnes, to talk about a very special movie, The Dark Knight Rises. We're the Dark It's a very special trilogy with Bane and, and Catwoman. It's a big movie. It's All maybe right. the biggest movie of the summer. You have more uh, permission to die. And first, I'm going to take off my mask. Uh, All right. Um, Do I have to take off my mask as well? You have your permission to take off the mask when the podcast is done. Oh. I'm Gotham Rocketing. <laughs> okay. Uh, your people, Gotham. <laughs> Alright, so... So, so one of the best parts control. of the Nolan movies, of course, is the is the voices of Bat... Is the voice of Batman by, played by Christian Bale. I will say right off the bat, Christian Bale is a great Batman. Oh yeah, he's great he, I don't Batman. think he's a great Bruce, Bruce Wayne, perhaps, but he's a great Batman. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of people, it, it takes a lot to pull off the, it, it, the, the, the. It's very silly. It can be very easy for the Dark Knight voice to be silly, and but, but he, he does it. He manages it. He manages it okay. It makes sense. Yeah. But uh, as, as, and then of course the, the new movie, um, we get excited for the villain, which is, which is Bane. The villain. Bane. And Bane, he, he has a nasally voice. He's got kind of an accent. What accent is that exactly? Through a voice machine. What what accent is that? Was it, was I doing it right? I don't even know. No, you you were do, you were doing it terribly. Oh okay. I don't know. Uh, it's he's got kind of like a British accent, kind of. Sure, Sean. 
If I can uh, eat so my let's cookie. talk about the film. Well, hold on. Oh, well, is this going know. to be spoiler free? No, actually, that's a great, great point to mention that this podcast is meant to be listened to and enjoyed by someone who has had the pleasure of watching the film. Preferably in or, IMAX. Or perhaps reading the script, if you be such a terrible person. Wow, you must be an awful person if you only read the script. <laughs> if you read the script, I'll, I'll find you. Like, first off, congratulations on finding the script, because the ending wasn't written down. And second off, you're a terrible person. That's why it anyway, says a terrible person. Deck. But, um, yeah, so there's going to be spoilers. Spoilers, 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 spoilers. Han Solo shot first. Spoilers. Um, not really spoiler, but anyway. Um, so here we go. We're going to start talking about it. And the, the way I'd like to begin talking about it is we're going to give, like, a short, like, rundown of our opinions of the first... Uh, was it six? Yeah, the first six Batman films we've had over the last two decades. Or so almost three, four decades now, really. It's like over four decades. Anyway. Okay. Um, so first we got Tim Burton's Batman. I liked it as a kid. Um, I think Tim Burton's Batman is, it's of course style over substance, but I think it's an important movie for the medium it's important. It's definitely an important movie for the me- the genre of superhero films. Uh, Batman Returns. Um, I'll start off by saying it's personally my favorite of the uh, movies from the '90s, '80s. I always get mixed up. Over the well, it was in the, the '90s. Is, yeah, it's it's one of my favorite movies from the '90s. Um, I think there's. The, I enjoyed it more than the first one. Um, I love the musical score lot, in both of them. A lot of good chemistry going on that film uh, what do you think of the second one mm, I mean it again it's Tim Burton so you're getting a lot of Burtonisms uh, that yeah. we, nowadays we come to know uh, just and get annoyed by but for its time I can see why people liked it I can also see why people complained why it was very dark um, and brooding but but Batman needed that edge. Batman did need that edge. Um, I just felt like uh, it was almost in the wrong hands. Like, I'm not saying almost. that the movies are... What? Almost. Almost. But I'm not saying that the movies are necessarily bad. I'm just saying that the director and his personal vision was a little bit too self-indulgent, shall we say. Um... I'll, I'll slightly disagree, but I get what you're saying. I respect it. Um, yeah, so I respect everybody. Respects every, everybody's I opinions think, here. Unless I think it's, Michael Keaton, uh, unless it's Michael uh, Bay and or Transformers, was the best Batman out of the movies. Just throwing that out there before we move on to the next films. Um, he's not the next, sorry. He's not the best Batman. He's the best Bruce Wayne. Absolutely, he's the best Bruce Wayne. He's the type of Bruce Wayne you would not. You look at and you go, wait, you're Batman. Yeah, he pulls it off very well. You, you, Bruce Wayne is dashing. He's not an idiot. It works. He's the world's greatest detective. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we get the Schumacher films. Um, the first Schumacher film was dreadful. That was actually the first Batman movie I saw in the theater. I think I was six. I'm sorry. I enjoyed it as I a remember, kid. I, I loved it. I was, I, I was head over heels for it. But then again, I was like five or six. Six. <laughs> and, and then we've got the... Bat nipples. The, Again, the I was Batman I was what forever. eight years. Was it Batman and Robin? Was it Batman? For, Batman and Robin was the fourth one. Batman the, and Robin was Batman the second Robin. one. Yeah, um, it's the worst one. It's bad. It almost killed superhero movies. I, I enjoyed it as a kid as well, and then it wasn't until two years after I saw it where I was like, Oof, "That was not good." And so, 1997 to 2005. Was it 97? I think it was 97. Yeah, 97 to 05. We did not have a Batman film. It was sad. It was a sad time. But was anyone... And then word comes from a relatively uh, non-known director at the time. You know, uh, he wasn't a household name. Now he is. Uh, Christopher Nolan. You know, he'd done, he done some good films, like Memento. But then again, and, those uh, were... Uh, you know, most of your Batman audience... I'm sorry, rephrase... 
Me, I have not seen. I had not seen Memento at the time because it was radar and. Well, I mean, most people hadn't seen Memento at the time. Yeah, it was an Still, independent, I think. a very independent film. And then, um, you know, but you know, some other people had seen Insomnia, which you know he so. did before Batman Begins, which uh, I actually did was able to see. So starting with the new wave of uh, superhero movies, which was started with you know the X Men, Marvel like started coming out with these you know, X Men, Spider Man. Uh, all these big, uh, you know, kind of silly action movies. A Spawn They're, comes to mind. I don't like consider Spawn to be part of the new wave of superhero movies, but that's... that's no, fine. I'm just saying it's like, it was still in that, um, that was, genre. See, Spawn for me is very much of the 90s. Okay, well, well then I, we'll... I, feel, I still feel like the, the modern superhero movies we got are very Well, then now. we'll say, uh, we'll say Superman Returns and Spider-Man 1, 2, and 3. I guess. Uh, but anyway, so we get we get our new wave of superhero movies. They're silly. They're obviously not as silly as the Schumacher movies. They're not as they're they're they're, they're trying to take it a little more seriously. They're they're trying new ideas. They're taking a lot more risks than I think they used to. Mm-hmm. In oh places. yeah, they're definitely trying to be like okay, well let's let's start pleasing more audiences here. Yeah, and they're actually trying to please the fans at the same time. So, uh, Christopher Nolan is Batman Begins. He's rebooting the Batman franchise. And I think I saw the trailer at, at the, one of the Scooby Doo movies. Wow. Because <laughs> I think there was, a, I think if I remember, there was a Batman Begins Scooby Doo trailer. Like it was a, a crossover at one point. I know it's awful. But, um. Uh, so Batman Begins. How would you? How, what would you say about Batman Begins? Well, I remember the only really thing I remember about seeing it the first time was the uh, I had a cough. Or was it, yeah, it was a cough, and that was one of the only movies that made me stop coughing. I was so involved in it. I had never seen, a, you know, of course, a Batman quite on that magnitude of realistic and, and, you know, enveloping and two and a half hours. It was, you know, really, that was really long for a superhero film. I'm going to be completely honest uh, about my opinion about Batman Begins. I don't particularly like it. Um, I thought it was really boring. Um, I thought the villains they chose were really poorly chosen um, as, as, <coughs> as a way to start the trilogy. Um... It just didn't. It didn't do it for me. I didn't like the bat. I just. I still don't like the tumbler. Just gonna throw that out there. I. I like. Here's the thing. I like that they went in a realistic tone with it, but I feel in a, in a lot of ways that robbed Batman of well, I, his style, his coolness factor. I don't feel like. I don't feel like with Batman Begins, that Batman. I felt like Batman lost a lot of what made me like Batman. Just throwing it out there. That's. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's a good movie. It's just. It's just not what I look for in Batman. But, da da da, the big one, the Dark Knight. This movie had hype. Had so much hype that it's unbelievable. Well, well at help, the time. What, what helped remember? that hype? Unfortunately, it was the the uh, untimely death of the uh, the villain character. The villain played by uh, oh not played by the, uh, the the actor playing the villain Joker, which was Heath Ledger, and uh, I, I to be honest I'd already heard here's the thing I was already excited about the movie before that I was already hyped for it I had already heard that he had a great performance like that that was going to be like what was going to make the movie was the Joker, mm-hmm. um and then he and then he dies and a lot of people were uh, so there's a lot of hype about it anymore and the movie delivers. On all counts. I mean, yeah, I was one of those people that did enjoy Batman Begins until The Dark Knight came out. And then it was kind of like, well, eh, it was okay. I mean, I still enjoy it to watch. I just feel like the first half is so much better than the second half. And uh, with The Dark Knight, oh, God, I, I still remember that screening of just being in there with my sister next to me and just being awestruck by it. I mean, just think of the moment of... The, the, the part where the 18 wheeler gets flipped. In any other film, that would be CG. And it was real. And there was that 
in that moment of silence right before it crashed down, was there a gasp in your audience? Because there wasn't mine. It was a... <gasps> During, sorry, what scene? The, the, the 18 wheeler flip. Oh yeah, that was the that was an incredible scene. You know, uh, there there's that that whole movie was filled with these impressive spectacles. Um, I, I, th that movie succeeds in a lot of ways. It's suspenseful. The it's it's is, definitely one of the uh, most suspenseful. Cut over most of the uh, superhero movies, the tone is pretty impressive. Some of the messages in the film are pretty impressive. The psychology of the film is a lot more impressive. Well, I mean, um, it's like, that is definitely one of, if not the most sus uh, suspenseful film I have ever seen. It, it is definitely... It's, it's, it's undeniably the best superhero film made at, at this date. Yeah, I mean, and... Just, I, just in terms of I just, filmmaking and just the quality of the film, it, it succeeds in a lot of ways. I, I don't think I've ever been in a theater having sweat go down my forehead like that film that made me happy. Yeah, see, I didn't have that happen, but... For me, but yeah, that the happened. Dark Knight. I was so involved in it. I, I almost couldn't sit still. The Dark Knight was a huge film, and it broke a billion dollars, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. it was the, I think it was the first film to do so, wasn't it? It was one of the first. I know Dead Man's Chest uh, okay. went over a yeah, billion, yeah. You're mostly right. because um, of worldwide revenue. Yeah, the Dark Knight was a big film. Um, it it showed a lot. It it, cha it, cha it changed a lot of attitudes in Hollywood. Arguably, like it was a rated R film. It was a big deal. Wait, what? Wasn't it a rated R film? No. Was it not? No. Okay, Dark Knight was anyway, PG thirteen, though it had that. a lot. Maybe I'm just wishful. It's wishful thinking. It, it had a lot of um, stuff that was considered to be R rated until the DVD came out and everyone started go framing by. F frame by frame and realize it's all off screen it's all implied uh, okay, but it still is very a menacing movie yes it, it was it's a very dark t the movie film had a very dark tone um, of course Heath Ledger's performance won him the Oscar posthumously and deservedly if, if he did win it I would oh, oh that would be bad yeah I'll, yeah I'll say that um, <laughs> I don't care Bring it on, film snobs. Um, but, uh, yeah, all, all three of you that are going to want to listen to this. Um, so, yeah, uh, the film was good. It was great. Uh, Christopher Nolan is now, you know, a household name. Um, he follows this up, of course, with the immensely successful Inception. Which, you know, um, was a huge, huge gamble for them. You know, a, a, a very intellectual action film that and wasn't it's an Batman franchise. It's not based on yeah anything else besides perhaps the Ducktales comics. But um, well, okay. Besides that, that, that yeah, one up. There's some wacky thing. theories about where he got his ideas for that movie. Well, what, what I'm saying <laughs> is, you know, it, it challenged um, audiences. It didn't dumb it down like Transformers or. Um, yeah. So yeah, those films do. So Nolan, Nolan does not talk down to his audience. He doesn't treat us like we're children. He gives us he gives us full movies, and he he he's gone farther into the Batman and farther into the universe that he's created than than any of the other Batman films have managed to do. And then we then we're going to talk about today. We're talking about this year's big release. The, I think the only movie that is more anticipated this year is probably The Avengers. Arguable, um, but you know, and, I mean that's arguable. It is. It is very arguable. I'm, you know, in regards to summer, I would say Avengers. Yeah, most anticipated. Yeah, you know, from everyone else but me. Yeah, and, and you know, some people will be listening to this and point out and say, Nolan fanboy, and you got me. Okay, yes, I am a Nolan fanboy. I guess you just don't like Joss Whedon. No, uh, I do enjoy Joss <laughs> Whedon. I just I don't like the characters of the Avengers. I'm just, I'm just teasing mm -hmm. you. But um, but yeah, I mean everybody loves Batman. Batman's cool. Um, so so we're gonna talk about the Dark Knight Rises. All right. So sum up the Dark Knight Rises in one word, Zach. Jaw dropping. Because that's what it did to me. <laughs> Topical. Topical? Yep, I'll say topical. The, the hell? 
I have to. I had to come up with one word that wasn't just like, "Oh, it was great." Amazing, <laughs> awe inspiring. And and there was and topical does fit into what some of our discussion is going to be. I'm sure. Um, so before we begin talking about the film, of course, I think it's important that uh, we acknowledge um, the tragedy that has become part of this film's legacy. Yeah. Uh, basically, to sum up, uh, on the night of midnight showing of its release a gunman wearing a gas mask opened fire inside the uh, Aurora Colorado theater uh, he's killed 12 people so far injuring about 58 others and um, he has been arrested but we'd like to not focus on that and we're going to read the uh, statement given by um, Christopher Nolan uh, he says Speaking on behalf of the cast and crew of Dark Knight Rises, I would like to express our profound sorrow at the senseless tragedy that has befallen the entire Aurora community. I would not presume to know anything about the victims of the shooting, but that they were there last night to watch a movie. I believe movies are one of the great American art forms, and they share the shared experience of watching a story unfold on screen is an important and joyful pastime. The movie theater is my home, and the idea that someone would violate that innocent and hopeful place in such an unbearable, savage way is devastating to me. Nothing any of us could ever adequately express, nothing any of us can say, ad adequately express our feelings for the innocent victims of the appalling crime. But our thoughts are with them and their families. God, this is like a really good thing to say. And I, I think it really... I, I, I don't want to linger on this but basically that, that pretty much sums up my feelings on it it sums up Zach's feelings yeah. for anybody who's a big fan of films this is a very um, it's very close to home it's very serious to us because uh, of the, uh, just the just the idea of going to watch something like that going to watch a film and being just having like not just like in that in that moment like that safe good place something terrible like that happening I mean something terrible like that happening anywhere but Certainly, certainly chilling. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about the film now because that's that's what's important. That's not that's not that that's what's important, but that is what we should talk about. Yeah. So how did you see this film, Sean? All right. So I saw this film at the uh, Paradiso Cinema uh, in. Uh, I saw it with uh, two couples. I, I was I was at the fifth wheel, as it were. Um, I saw it around twelve fifty yesterday, and uh, yeah. Then I went home and I played D and D for a few hours and went to bed. What, what about you? Well, uh, I got a friend of mine to buy tickets to this uh, a month ago. And we went over to Opry Mills, which is in Nashville. We saw it in the IMAX, mm. the 1570 millimeter uh, IMAX that we have here. And uh, we got front row, not front row, but middle, middle to back, center seats. And uh, honestly, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that in my life. I, I mean, I've only ever seen one other IMAX film that had IMAX... Uh, footage in it, and that was Mission Impossible 4. So, seeing this film in the IMAX was just... If, if you have the opportunity, please do yourself a favor. Spend the extra three or four bucks. You will thank me so much later. It has about 72 minutes of footage that is, you know, IMAX. So, I mean... Oh, it was good. And then afterwards, I had to think about it for a few hours while walking the mall. And I saw this at the 320 showing. And there were no previews, so it was like 323 by the time it started. Oh, you didn't have any previews? I did not get any previews because because the film is 2 hours and 45 minutes. And All right. and um, because the, the it's yeah, IMAX it's IMAX, it's it's the it's the film. It's not a digital IMAX. So our screen was 80 feet right. tall. And then they actually said at the beginning there will not be no trailers and there is no footage after the credits. 
Yeah, I wish they had told us that. Um, I'll tell you two things. Uh, there were trailers, and, uh, for example, the one big trailer for the film was the trailer for the uh, Zack Snyder Superman movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, we stayed after the credits, and there was nothing, and we were sad. <laughs> we, we, all ha- we were all very sad that so there was nothing after the credits, because we we'd waited that long. Um, but yeah, so we saw the, the film on the, the same day, it was, so it's all good. Um, kind of have that whole experience um hmm. where to begin right. let's, start, <laughs> let's start talking about the film so the film opens up with the cia uh taking transporting a prisoner by plane dr and, pavel uh, dr pavel as it were. and they talk about the mysterious masked man known as bane and lo and behold, Bane has managed to get his way onto the plane. He killed several people. Wow. The AD, was it ADR? Yeah, it's all ADR. It, the the full uh, the, the uh, prologue was shot in full IMAX. So every every audio sound effect was pretty much added in post. Yeah. So they... Uh... <sighs> so Bane... He, uh, he, 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 he steals the prisoner, they crash the plane, they leave a fake body. Um, so it lets you know right off the bat that this is we have a very serious villain. He's not to be underestimated. Well, here's something for you. What if I told you that that intro was 95% real? Like, we mean, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I totally believe that. It's, it's, it's all real except for those two last shots. Are you talking about the shots where they're uh, they're gliding up into the plane? Yeah, where they're going back up in the plane. Yeah, I knew that was fake. (laughs) Where the uh, the plane falls around them. Those two shots. Those. That's the only CG in that entire sequence. I hate to say it, but I totally, I totally, uh, I totally, I totally knew that was CG. (laughs) I hate to say it. Well, I mean, but everything else was real. Yeah, everything else. Think about that. Everything. They held a plane. Yeah. Vertical in the air. Yeah. Its wings and people off. repelled onto it. I mean, any other director, that would be CG. But it's Christopher Nolan. All right. That, that's so, what I love about him. So the big story of this movie, so let me give you the quick little synapses. This takes synapses. place, um, was it eight years? Eight years. Eight years after the uh, after what happened in The Dark Knight, uh, Bruce Wayne has become a recluse Batman uh, after becoming, you know, criminalized, Fugitive. and Harvey Dent becoming a martyr, um, he so basically Batman is gone. He's been gone for years. Bruce Wayne is basically like this—he's a crazy guy who lives in a you know big house, like doesn't talk to anybody, doesn't do anything. Don't you, people don't even know if he's still, you know, alive or sane. He he's just in there. Yeah, no one even and, sees him. He doesn't even show up to the party. And because things are so good in Gotham, uh, peaceful, he doesn't think they need the Batman for one. And uh, Alfred is angry with Bruce, and Gordon is Gordon is torn up inside about this this whole event because he's having to lie about Harvey Dent and having to lie about Batman. So he's been torn up up about it for about eight years. Um, and we're introduced to. Uh, Joseph Gordon Lewis character uh, Detective Blake. Uh, actually, not yet. I mean, that's that's gonna happen. I'm just kind of giving like a overview oh, oh, okay. of, of the of, like the big characters before, without any like. Well, I mean, we're introduced spoilers. to Catwoman first, so yeah. So we're introduced to Catwoman, uh, played by Anne Hathaway. Uh, we're introduced to uh, a young plucky detective uh, who kind of has to take over. He's not a detective yet. Well, he's going to become a detective, the point is. He's a detective <laughs> for most of the movie. Okay, touche. <laughs> uh, uh, detective Blake, played by Joseph Gordon-Lewitt. And then, of course, uh, we have this mysterious figure, Bane, looming in the distance. You know, there's whispers and all kinds of you know rumors and things happening in, in Gotham. So that's kind of where we're starting off. And so the movie sets you up with, like, all these expectations. I, that's, I think that's one of the good things about this one. 
is you are set up with there's more than one thing to be interested in and waiting to like you're you're suspenseful and it's not it's be, what's great about Christopher Nolan is that he's juggling in this movie. Yeah, he's juggling jugg- quite a bit. There's quite a few things to be anticipating in this movie at once. Like you're anticipating when you're going to see Bane next. Uh, you're anticipating, you know, of course, what he's doing. You're anticipating Catwoman, what she's going to do, what is her involvement in this. You're anticipating, of course, when Bruce Wayne's going to dress up like Batman again. Uh, you're, you know, I mean, that you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things to be excited about in this movie. There's a lot more. There's a lot. There's a lot more threads in this movie. Yeah, there's definitely more threads than in any other uh, Batman film such far, and um, you know, I, I was able to follow all of them. I just felt like it was a little bit too much. It At, felt you know, a little within stretched. the first within the first ten minutes. It's like oh, here's all this stuff, and it's like whoa. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I'd say if anything, it felt like the movie it was a little stretched. Um, all the other Batman movies have kind of taken place. Besides, maybe the first one have taken place in a short. And besides, I mean, besides Batman Begins, because that one kind of was you know an origin story. Mm-hmm. But like the actual plot of that movie, that wasn't about the origin story. That all took place in a short amount of time. Yeah, like when he becomes Batman and like Ra's al Ghul and all that. He yeah, that that kind of seems. Like the actual like the plot seems pretty self contained. And and the Dark Knight, this the plot was very self contained. It would, like seemed like it only took place over like what, a couple weeks maybe? Uh maybe a month. Yeah, maybe a month. Pretty short amount. This one it takes place about over like what was it like like it's over five well, months. Well it was like, uh, half a year. As soon as Bane took over, that's four months. Yeah. So, so. maybe five months? I'd say a, half a year. Yeah, five or six months. So it's definitely um, the largest one. This this film feels like it in certain ways. I mean, it isn't. It's, I will say this: it doesn't feel like the film. The film doesn't feel like it's too long. Oh, absolutely not. I want a longer. But cut. it just feels like there's a, there's a lot going on in, in that in that way. If there's any criticism I would have for the movie in that respect, it would be that I kind of felt like some of the threads were un. I mean, it feels like everything's done in the end of the movie like it, it, but it's not completely satisfying that would be my that's my only criticism of the movie so far let's get into what we liked about the movie uh of course the action was superb was superb it's, it's, oh sublime it's so good um i mean this the the fight scenes uh between batman and bane are incredible there are, two of them, there are two in the movie. There's one in the first act and uh, one in the third act. And Batman gets shit kicked out of him in both. Yeah, more or less. Uh, well, no, in the, remember the last act, he kicks Bane through a fucking window. <laughs> he kicked, he's kicking Bane's ass in that fight. <laughs> but uh, Catwoman, played by Anne Hathaway, is 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 is, uh, is a, was a great choice. She's a very talented young woman. Um, I think she managed to pull off what could have potentially been a very awful performance. Because like, I, I think there's a lot of well, I think like, everybody no got their pitchforks sharp and were ready to, you know, absolutely tear yeah. it apart. Because conceptually, I'm going to be honest. Conceptually, Catwoman is kind of a ridiculous character, even within the Batman universe. She's just kind of like it's very difficult to like Catwoman for me. It's like she's just she's just such a jerk. <laughs> Uh, it's hard to explain. Like she's the bad girl, but like I'm like, why does Batman put up with this like all the time? But in this movie, I think they they did it very well. Um, her character, you kind of get her motivations pretty quickly. It doesn't like I, I was a little, like you know, she backs she does backstab Batman, but I thought her motivations were pretty clear in this one. I mean, yeah, it, it did what show you- she was the world's greatest thief. She's an extremely good thief. Yeah, she. The first thing, the first thing she does in the movie is, uh, since we're on the spoilers now, uh, Catwoman steals the pearls from Batman. Uh, his mother's pearls from his vault, and uh, well, rather from Bruce Wayne. Did you notice that and she was wearing the pearls before and after? Yeah, I didn't until he pointed out, and I was like, Oh, oh no, no, no! Sorry, yeah. I did. No, sorry, I didn't realize she was wearing the pearls uh, after. No, no, no. I mean, before and after. No, 
Uh, yeah, so she steals the pearls, uh, she escapes, Bruce Wayne's tracking her, and this kind of is what helps propel Batman back onto the scene. She's kind of the catalyst for his character. I think I think what we will do for this for this discussion is an easier way to do this because this is just a big movie. Is we'll talk about each of the characters and kind of their arc. It's a good yeah, way to talk about it. <laughs> All right. So Catwoman steals from Bat. She steals from Bruce Wayne. Uh, we discover that uh, she does this as part of a. Uh, it, she wasn't actually stealing the pearls big deal she was stealing bruce wayne's fingerprints correct or trying yeah to. she's trying to um because she works for Daggert. Well, she needs the fingerprints for daggert uh of bruce wayne's fingerprints who's, the, who's one of our antagonists yeah, and that's the thing I, I i honestly wondered it's like you know what was the point of his character it's it's kind of vital. He's he represents. You know, he re- we'll get it, we'll get okay. into him in a second. But, uh, we'll explain what he represents in the movie and everything. Because this movie, if this movie definitely builds this movie, I, I, it'll be interesting to watch the whole trilogy now because the mythos that uh, Nolan has built in these three movies is really interesting and impressive, um, and the, the ideas behind it all. So Catwoman steals from from Bruce Wayne because she wants. Basically, a get out of jail free. No, guard. clean your slate. Yeah, clean your slate. That's even better. She basically wants to erase all of her her record of being a uh, a thief, so that she can get a fresh start. Um, and not not to, she doesn't want it just you know to continue doing more crime. It seems that she wants to do it so that she can be le- like she can go legit, so she can be a good person. Yeah, so she doesn't have to do this anymore, mm-hmm. right? So she's dealing with the bad guys because Daggert's the mouthpiece or the the exploitative body for Bane to use. And uh, so then she there's kind of like this pseudo so like there, there's kind of like the pseudo romance thing going on between her and and, Bruce, and Batman and Selena Kyle and Bruce Wayne. Like there's kind of like they're flirting and going back. Well, it's and definitely forth. playful. Those scenes are pretty well done. I'd say that I liked Bruce Wayne in this movie than I did in the last two. Movies. Yeah, he felt more Bruce Wayne and less Batman. I I don't got time for Bruce Wayne. Yeah, it felt like there were two different characters this time. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that Batman is not Bruce Wayne and Bruce Wayne is not Batman, but it felt a little bit different. It felt more distinct. Um, I liked it more than the stupid Playboy version of Bruce Wayne. Um, and so. She betrays Batman. She he he she thinks that so Batman so after she believes that she's been double crossed by Dagger, which basically is what happens. He like says there is no such thing as the clean slate chip. It doesn't exist. And then Bruce Wayne's like it does exist, and my friend will get you in contact with it if you take him to Bane. And so she takes Batman down to the tunnels where she traps him in a. Basically, like a, what, a what's mono, it, what's it, mono, yeah, a fight, fight to the death arena, fight to the death in the dark. And did she mean to do that on purpose? Yes, that was totally on purpose. I mean, what was that? What for? Uh, that was because uh, she was scared of them, I guess, and they were giving her a way out. Remember, she gets a, in the next scene. Oh, she okay. get, They give her, they give her a uh, because she knows that bad shit's about to go down, and she doesn't think she can do anything about it. So she's essentially joining the bad guys to save well, not even, herself. Yeah, she's just she's just helping them out so she can escape. Because she knows that like bad that like Gotham's about to be ruined, and that if she doesn't leave, she's dead. So they give her a plane ticket to wherever, and she's out. She's got money, I'm guessing. And she gets caught. She's not allowed to leave. <laughs> well, by uh, by Detective Blake, he's a detective at this point. Yeah, he is a detective at this point, but you know he uh, he he uh, puts we'll her get into in his Blackgate character next, prison. I think he puts her in Blackgate prison. Yep, he sends and, her to prison, and then and she's there for a good what twenty minutes. And then the the Blackgate prison is broken open. She escapes, and she kind of because they're all forced. They're kind of stuck on Go- in Gotham by this point of the movie because of the because uh, Bane has kind of taken it over at this point and so uh, it seems like she's kind of just taken over her neighborhood 
is protecting her friends and, and did, some children. Did you get that she was kind of a, like in a uh, lesbian that relationship? That was not what it was at all. If you need to read the comics. <laughs> no, did you feel that from the film though? No, no, no. It was, that I, was not... I almost got that because like when her I girlfriend, think... uh, roommate chick comes. That's over... actually she's, the the girlfriend is. Uh, for, first of all, the girlfriend's probably a lot. It's probably like probably like supposed to be like sixteen or seventeen. Okay, because she looked like she was in her mid to late twenties. In most of the modern comics, uh, Catwoman has either either started out as a prostitute. Or she is befriended prostitutes. Like, she's kind of been like a guardian of prostitutes. So, like, yeah. she protects the downtrodden. I'll, That's I'll what Catwoman... That because late, earlier in the film, when there was this guy saying, oh, she stole my wallet, that makes sense. Yeah, so they, they, they're not, not like a lesbian. They're not necessarily... They could be, but I don't think that was what they were going for. It's supposed to be more of, like, girlfriends. You know, like, not in a sexual way. Like, like friends. They were friends. Yeah, girlfriends. That's what, that's what we say. Yeah, it's not. I don't think it was supposed to be taken as sexual. I mean, that's kind of. I think that that might say more about the people who were watching the movie's psychology than the movie. Um, cause yeah, <sighs> cause Catwoman is a very flirty, flirtatious. Yes, character. very very sultry, flirtatious, but that's kind of sexy. The, the point of her character is she's kind of like this deceptive. You know, she's a she's a black widow. <laughs> Nope. Um, yep. Um, uh, but, uh, eh. so we see that she, of course, you know, she's upset about the situation. Not everything about it. Because there's this very big theme of her, like, feeling that the rich deserve to be fucked around with. That's basically, like, her Robin Hoodish like, philosophy. Yeah, you know, doesn't he actually explicitly call her out saying, you know, you're kind of yeah. like Robin Hood? Yeah, because she's more like Robin Hood than he is. Because she, she only cares about basically she, she doesn't mind stealing from rich people, and she tries to take care of of you know the downtrodden. So she's got those. That's kind of the dichotomy of her character. Not dichotomy, but that's kind of the philosophy. So now that you know Bane's taken over, she she's just kind of like surviving and taking care of uh, the people that she cares about, and um, kind of keeping her ears open, her eyes open, and kind of hoping that Batman might still be alive because she doesn't know. If Batman is alive at this point in the movie, and Batman arrives, and so she teams up with Batman, be goody goody yada yada. He, there's kind of like this moment for her character where she, he's like, "You only do this one thing, and you can get out of Gotham. I'll give you my Batman cycle." Blah. Yeah. <laughs> and and then, he, but she's like, he's like, "I know you're bigger than this. You're better than that." No guns. And of course. She ter- she decides to be a good guy, and comes back and helps them. No guns. That's kind of that's that's pretty much her character arc. I mean, uh, she kind of becomes. It's implied that they get together at the end. Oh no! It's explicitly shown, isn't it? Yeah. It's like no, they yeah, are together. Yeah, but like, are they together? Together? Or are they just together? I'm thinking you know they're I'm together. Like, together, because that's what yeah. Alfred wanted. But that's not what's supposed to happen. We'll get we'll get into the, my, the my issues with the plot. But we'll get into my issues with the plot right and the very now. concept of a trilogy for Batman. Um, <laughs> why I have issue with it. Um, <laughs> it. It'll get into like my overall issues with this, this trilogy. We'll get into it. Um, it's not a, it's not like there's anything wrong with the trilogy. It'll be more like a just like things that I think would you'll see. Um, let's move on to the next character. Let's talk about Blake. Blake, um, he he mostly spends his time in the uh, the orphanage and caring about the kitties, and then trying to figure out. He's a cop. Yeah, he is a cop. <laughs> Let's say that Joseph Gordon Lewis is a cop. He, he's the hothead. He's a young hothead cop from Brooklyn. I mean Gotham. <laughs> well, let's go down there. Someone tell this hothead to shut up. Yeah, they call him a hothead like four times yep. in the movie. So basically, he's like the cop who, like, he says he's the he's you know what he's the audience mouthpiece basically. Yeah, I I believe that. He's, he's the character who's just like he's C three PO. He's like, why don't you guys do something? Like he's the he says what you're thinking more or less, <laughs> or does what he don't he, don't he blow the of. bridge. Yeah, you've killed us all. And so his, you son his of whole, a bitch. His whole, well, let's get into his whole okay. arc. So we meet the character. And he's introduced. We kind of already know what he's gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> Don't and, spoil it. Don't spoil it yet. And so, and so we see this young cop. He helps out uh, Gordon, 
Is that, I think that's how we int he's introduced, right? He either helps out Gordon or... Yeah, he helps yeah. out Gordon. Yeah, you see yeah, you see him with a Catwoman and all that. All right, so uh, he become, kind of becomes entangled in all of this because he's the he goes from being a, a cop to a detective after helping Gordon. And Gordon sees potential in him because while well, the rest of the cops are just kind of like... Gordon finds out about Bane. Nobody else believes him, but... but uh, nice but Killer Blake. Croc reference, though. So, was there was that? a nice Killer Croc reference, yeah, like, though. I guess. What do you mean? The he was like, the, well, uh, you know, he, he was talking about, you know, how other people thought he was crazy, and they asked, like, well, did you see any giant alligators down there, too? I guess that could be... No, a that's Killer, Killer Croc. Croc reference. Killer Croc. Or an urban myth it's, reference. It's, it's, but, Killer, you know. it's Killer Croc. It's Batman Universe Killer Croc. Okay. Fair enough. But, um... So, he, he, so Blake is kind of our character who's kind of trying to unravel the mystery... He, uh, he, he knows, he, he, like, Gordon tells him who Bruce Wayne is. No, well, that not really, he guesses. That, well, that's one of my, I'll say, we'll talk about, right now, let's talk about Blake. Blake was one of my problems with the movie. Because he, because he just knows who Bruce, that Bruce Wayne is Batman. He highly suspects it, uh. No, he just, like, remember, he just goes, like, the first scene between the two characters, he goes to Bruce Wayne's house, he says, Bruce Wayne, I know you're Batman, more or less. That's more or less what he says. And he's like, this is why I know. It's like, because when I was a kid, um... We'd look up to you. We looked up to you when I was in the, I was in the orphanage, and yada yada. So, he's kind of there as, like, the, he's the moral, he's basically, like, the big wubby. Not even, he's not a wubby. What's the, what's the term you would use for, like, the character that he's supposed to feel what you're feeling? audience character he's a mouthpiece I don't know yeah basically he's just there to like he's feeling what you're feeling he's saying to Batman what you want to say his character I don't know the fact that he knew who Batman was was kind of silly to me I don't know it just seemed it just didn't seem right he didn't need to know who Batman was that's all I'm gonna say like to, to begin with he didn't need to know he could have found out by the end of the movie but it seemed weird that he knew who Batman was in the very first act I guess I need to see it again because in the so I'll spoil it a little bit. He turns out that he's going to be our new Robin. Do all that is revealed because that at his, the end of the, his first name at is the end Robin of the movie. John Blake. Yeah, basically through the movie, he just kind of helps Batman and Gordon, and he's he's kind of you get the idea you get you definitely get the idea that he's going to be the new Robin. And at the end of the movie, we discover his real name is Robin, and uh, we 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 see him go to the Bat Cave or the new Bat Cave. So he's going to take over for Batman at least for a while. And, um, okay, let me explain something about Robins. Um, most of the Robins have basically, like, had to be adopted by Bruce Wayne as mm -hmm. a child. Like, the first Robin and the second Robin. Like, the first Robin was, you know, Dick Grayson. Dick Grayson was just, like, the orphan acrobat. Second Robin was Jason Todd, who was, like, a kid who tried to steal the wheels off the Batmobile. <sighs> He's the worst one. Uh, and then you've got the, the newest one, which is Damian Wayne, and then but the, the one that I think that they were they were kind of going for in this movie was Tim Drake. Because this Rob, the Robin in the movie is not based on any of the Robin, Robin in the comics, but uh, Tim Drake became became Robin because he figured out that well, Batman who was Nightwing? Bruce Wayne. Dick Grayson. Okay, because that's what a lot of people are saying. Yeah, I mean that that would be that would make more sense because of his age, but he's going to be called Robin because they imply that it would be weird if they didn't do that, in my opinion. Okay. Um, and Nightwing, Nightwing's a character with a whole bunch of baggage. If you just make him an adult, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work because the whole point of Dick Grayson, aka Nightwing, is that he kind of grew up as Robin. Like Batman is his dad. Like, imagine that your father figure from age, like, 10 to n you're an adult is Batman slash Bruce Wayne. So it's a little different. It doesn't really work for him to be Nightwing. That would kind of be like if you, like, like you had a Spider-Man movie where, like, it was just, like, some dude who was, like, a scientist in his 40s became Spider-Man. Mm, which would be weird. Yeah, no. It, it, it no, it, it, it's just, it's kind of disrespectful to the history of the character, if that's the case. If they decide to make him Nightwing. If they make him Robin, that's fine, because there's been four other Robins, at least. So you can, you can have a completely new story. Um, 
but Tim Drake, the, the point I was trying to make was Tim Drake was the Robin that became Robin because he figured out that Batman was Bruce Wayne. And he, that was supposed to prove that he was, you know, a great detective. That he was able to figure this out. The fact that the, the main, that, that Blake, a.k.a. the new Robin in this movie, kind of just, like, figures it out by, like, happenstance. It's not like he figured it out because he's a great detective. He figured it out because when he was a kid, he was just like, oh, this makes sense. <laughs> yeah, totally. Kinda. Yeah, there's there's no, like... There's no process there. It's it's it that that to me was a little disingenuous to the film, to the series. I don't know. I didn't like it. Not just saying I didn't like the character. I thought he was. A, I thought he did a good job. I wouldn't mind seeing Joseph Gordon-Levitt as the new uh, new Batman or the new Robin or whatever. He's a good actor. He's funny, entertaining, got good chemistry. Yeah. He's a cool kid. Um, so let's move on. So there's not much to say about that character. He's, he, he doesn't really have much of an arc, really. I mean, he comes back. That's about it. Yeah. He does play into... The, we'll talk about him when we play into the themes of the movie. Because um, he's basically like the character that is forced through one of the themes of the movie. Which we'll get into. Um, the other major characters... Uh, one we can talk about really quickly is Gordon. Gosh, he, they just um, decided to almost write him out of this film, didn't they? Yeah, he gets shot in the first he, act. He, how many times does he get shot? I saw him grab his leg. And that was about it. For him getting See, shot. He, yeah, he got shot. Like, well, it happened after he rolled over into the water. That's what I'm saying. Is I saw him grab his leg, but no, he mu- he must have got shot in the chest in the back. We, like, we he never got saw it. times in the torso. We yeah. never saw it. But he got shot. He got shot several times. Um, so Gordon gets injured, and that's why Blake kind of becomes his for a large portion of the movie. Blake Blake is the one who does all the Gordon stuff <laughs> until Bane takes over, and then Gordon has to be a badass. Yeah, Gordon's like. Yeah, I've had enough of this. So Gordon was originally going to plan to become like the the re- the rebel the rebel leader like he was going to be like the guy who opposes Bane as the new leader of the people. At for, for a moment, that was the idea because that would he's the most likely, he's the hero. And then Bane reveals his uh speech where he was going to reveal the you know all the stuff about Harvey Dent being a lie. Mm-hmm. And and it, it ends with his kind of resignation. And so, basically, like, there's no way now that Gordon could do that. So he kind of has to become a rebel, like, just in the sense of, like, leading the people. Like, trying to lead a way to save the cops that are stuck down in the sewers. Stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, he doesn't... So he's he is kind of incapacitated in this movie. But his, his whole kind of shtick in this movie is the way that the whole process, like, over the last eight years, he has nothing. Because he's all... Per, he's per, he has nothing but, like, his... His "quote unquote" status, which is about to be taken away from him, because they mentioned in the movie that he's probably going to be fired uh, because of, of the lie, because of how it's torn him up, and so it's kind of like his character kind of represents this idea of sacrifice, uh, like sacrificing your image for the greater good, like be- like becoming the villain. Like he's basically like the carryover the, the image of like he's basically the carrying over the message of the last film. Yeah, and then after that, he's uh, he's just a part of the uh, rebels, and um... he does get one of the best lines in the movie, in my opinion. What was that line? Well, not the best. He doesn't get the best line, but he he's part of it. Like when uh, when he figures when uh, he says to Bruce Wayne that you know calls him a hero, he says to Batman, and then Batman's like, sometimes a hero is just the guy who puts a jacket over the kid after he loses his parents. Like that's how he reveals to him that he's Bruce Wayne. Yeah. I thought that was a pretty good line, and I th- that was a, that was like summed up the, the message of the movie, a lot in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, Gordon has a pretty pretty stable part in the movie. Um, let's see, there's th- I think there's three other characters we need to talk about. Okay. All right, let's talk about. Um, do we want to talk about Batman first, or do we want to talk about Bane? Let's first? talk about Bane first. Who is Bane? All right, so Bane is a villain. You don't um, say. As a villain, I like as as the villain of our movie, as the, the quote unquote. Villain. Really, um, I would have never guessed that, based off all the quite, marketing I th- campaign. I think I think he did a really good job. Um, I thought he was really, like he he, the idea of his character was pulled off very well in the movie. Like here's the thing: in the comic books, Bane is like this big like behemoth, like just giant. Giant, giant, giant super steroid creature. Mm-hmm. Like inhumanly big. 
So in the movie, of course, in the, in the Nolan universe, that wouldn't work. So in this universe, he's just kind of like this... He, we, I like what... Okay, I'm going to say this. I really love how Nolan adapted Bane for this universe. Like, I was impressed what he did with the character. Because in the comics... So the idea of Bane is that he grew up in a prison. And... Uh, which they're kind of going to turn it on the head of the movie. Uh, they, he, he, was, he was a child who grew up in a prison and then became this, like, super mercenary. And then when he was introduced in the comic books, uh, he defeats Batman and breaks his back. Which was quite an incredible moment. Yeah, in the movie. So in the movie, Bane is obviously, these, there's this big plot coming to the Gotham. And kind of Bane's thing, so like, Joker was all about chaos, right? Well, yeah, and then uh, Bane is basically Bane organized is... chaos. <laughs> No, and he's not even. No, Bane is not about chaos. Bane is about like primal, like the primal order. It's all about like fear, and and it's 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 pr- it's it's almost primitive. I'm gonna say it's like he's basically all about survival of the strongest. Like basically like that's that's like one of the, that's the philo- that's the underlying philosophy behind the way that he uses his philosophy in the movie. So like his. So okay, let's go back to to Ra's al Ghul. So, like, Ra's al Ghul is all about, you know, um, when, when a society becomes too corrupt and big and opulent and, you know, all that, it needs to come crashing down. So that, yeah, the, the people can rebuild a better yeah. society or rebuild a new civilization. So the idea of this movie is, one of the underlying ideas of this movie, which is Bane is about, which is that the people, basically the people that have all the power don't deserve it. That's what Bane's argument is. That's like his whole like that that's his theory. And that basically it's it the power belongs to those who take it. Mhm. All right? And that's basically what Bane does in the movie. Is in every like the the people like when ba- there there's I usually hate it in, in movies when a when a villain kills one of his minions. But it made sense in this movie because it establishes something about the characters. It establishes about the loyalty of his men because they're so a because he's kind of like a revolutionary. Well, figure. yeah, he, he has a you know an army that you know he, he basically tells one of his minions it's like you know search him and then I'll kill you. So what does the mercenary do? Yeah, and you know, you know for a moment him, I thought he was just and then fucking he kills with him. him. Yeah, I thought he, I was like kill him and then I'll kill like search him, kill him and then I'll kill you. And I really thought that he was just kind of like for a moment there I thought he, I didn't think he was gonna do it. Nope. Like, I was like, but I was like, no, but in the back of my head, I was like, no, he said he was going to kill him. This is the kind of villain who, when he says he's going to do something, he does it. That's the, that, that was one of the things. Is this is not a villain who just, like, says he's going to do something. He does it. And, uh, that's, I, I love active characters. <laughs> and what Bane, when Bane says he's going to do something, he does it. And, uh, so Bane kind of, like, takes over the city in the movie. After he, after he defeats Bruce Wayne... In, co- in single combat, he defeats Batman in single combat. Breaks his back. Uh, he takes over the city with the threat of a uh, a neutron bomb, and he tells the people to take back the take city. Back your city. Yeah, so there's kind of like this weird like. So he believes uh, he he believes. What he's doing is right. Yeah, is restoring restoring the natural order. Society, the corrupt civilization itself is 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 a corrupt thing. Like the idea of civilization, like and it breeds corruption, which which we see in the movie. We see all these rich people like living like you know kings, and they're all these poor people. So like yeah, you, you know, it's. It's funny, he's kind of taking the idea of the 99%. Yeah, especially, yeah, it, it really does, uh... And he's turning it, like, what is the, what is the, like... Basically, so here's the thing. Bane is using it as an... That's basically his argument, is that 1% of people control everything. It shouldn't be that way. Every, basically, you should get what you work for. If you can take it, it's yours. He's basically, it's anarchy. It's, 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 it really it's is the anarchy. law of... Yeah, it's basically anarchy. Yeah, you're right. It is anarchy. 
He's ba but he's ba it's it's the idea of the order of nature as opposed to the order of society. Exactly. It's complete dis dissolving dissolving yeah. of a s society. It's it's the anarchy of it's the democracy of anarchy. Yeah. Right. And um so he turns that on its head, but the of course the the message of the movie that comes back over this is the idea that you cannot I, I think Gordon kind of like nails it. What's the what's the so what's the answer to this question? He, like when he when, remember when he goes he goes and talks to the uh, the other policeman, the commander. Yeah, he's, he he's like hiding in his in the his guy. House. The guy. Yeah, he's hiding. Yeah, so like all the cops are going to get together and they're going to like rush. Bane. Yeah, it's, it's like the final Bane rush. Bane's men at the end of the movie. They're basically they're gonna, yeah they're going to help Batman. They're going to you know they're going to fight him off and then they're going to get the neutron bomb. Yeah, so it's so this is that by the way that was, was an incredible so scene. It's good. The the last act of this movie is incredible. Um, that sent chills down my spine. Um, Cause it's just like like that's exactly like you what you want to see in cops. That's, that's like the ah the, Jesus. Um, so yeah, he goes he goes to so Gordon goes to the cowardly cop and says you know you got to go out there and help you know lead these guys. They look to you and he's like I can't do it. You know what's the point? You know, uh, he's won. This is their city, and and he's like, the city's corrupt, right? You know, he's done. But basically, he gives up, and then and then Gordon says, you can't fix the city from outside of it. Like you can't fix. Basically, it's that you. It, the way to fi the the way to fix a system is not to break it. Yeah. The way to fix a system is to fix it. Throwing like basically you, you don't throw out a system. You don't destroy what you have. You try to fix it. You make it better. And that's kind of what that's kind of what the positive theme of the movie is, which is that everyone has the potential to make their life around them better. Right? Like bas basically it's that it's 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 the people. It, that's kind of thing. It's it's about the people have have the power to fix things. Yeah, them. so it's like why sense? not try instead of yeah. That's ba Batman represents that hope. He represents that hope of like Batman is that is like he's kind of like of the, of the, see Batman is justice in the sense of like fairness like he's he's basically like what you hope would happen which is that the good guys win and the bad guys lose right which doesn't always happen in real life but that's kind of the idea so Bane represents the the evil idea of the nine which is the, like the evil idea of the of how to fix society which is just destroy it society is bad brr. And Gordon and, and Batman and all the good guys in this movie are all about the way to fix society is to fix it. The way to fix, you know, the situation is fix it, right? Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so Bane takes over the city. Um, we have the so he kind of like they do they have like a fake court where they're they're punishing all of the rich and powerful of Gotham. Yeah, a great cameo by uh, Jonathan oh, Crane yes. again. As a scarecrow, that was great. I think everyone loved that. You, could you everyone. think you could replace the Joker in there instead of a uh, scarecrow? Maybe, but I, I personally feel like scarecrow works better for that position. I don't know. It just seems like something. It doesn't seem like something Joker would do. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, think Joker would. I don't think Joker would cooperate with the situation. A lot of people are complaining. Well, there's no Joker in it. Of course, there's not. And I'm like, that's the service. only place you could fit Joker in there. Yeah. But, um... Of course, then we have the the imagery, the, the, the symbolism of the, uh... So, the, in the courtroom, of course, they have... You have death or exile. In which, if you get exiled, you, it means that you are basically, like... The long walk, right? So, uh, we're, first we're thing, explain what from, Batman... Uh, so, so as I said, Bane takes over the city. No one can leave. Martial law via his his cronies, more or less. He has Batman's weapons. He steals Batman's weapons. Um, and uh, basically, the the long walk, which is they 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 put them out on ice. Thin, so so basically, the the thematic joke there is that the the rich and powerful get to experience what it's like to be walking on thin ice for a change. Did you get that? Mm, yeah, I that's mean, an analogy used for like living in the lower class. Like it's the idea of like you're living day by day, walking on thin ice. It's 
kind of the idea. But, um, I think. Uh, so yeah, so we, 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 so Bane takes over the city, he corrupts all these things, he corrupts all these ideas, uh, but then the cops fight back, Batman comes back, um, Bane, it, I think he seems kind of surprised by the whole, like, the fact that, that the, the, the way that the cops and Batman kind of come back like that. I think the reason he loses is because of, of, he kind of gives into his, like, fear maybe? I don't know, that makes sense? Yeah. He becomes he becomes afraid of Batman. Uh, in fact, you know the moment where it turns for Batman is Batman. So of course Bane wears an op Bane has to wear a special mask because he, he was disfigured horribly. Well, he got and he, got he, he needs it to breathe. Yeah, he needs it to breathe because he doesn't have a. I, I, here's what I, th I they kind of don't fully imply it in the movie, but I don't think he has a nose and I don't think he has like most of his mouth like in the front of it. I don't think he has lips. Which by the way, uh, one of the things one of my friends said was. Um, his mouth doesn't move during, like his jaw doesn't move during the entire movie. That would make so sense, because, because what I got was it was like it was pumping, uh, like morphine or you know some anesthetic into it, so that he that could makes sense. basically it's keeping him alive. You know, keeping him to to be able to function, you know, pain wise. And then Batman punches it so hard that he uh, snaps off pieces of it. And uh, that's when Bane kind of like gives into his rage, and that's kind of when Batman starts kicking his ass. Is because, like, he starts instead of like you know, f like up until this point in the movie, Bane has been completely uh, he's a like he's quote unquote monster, but he's been very in control. Like when he breaks Batman's back, he's completely in control of that situation. Because we find we find out that he's it, so this is the so in the in in the comics he's like like I already told you what the idea of this character is in the movie in the Nolan verse he is Ra's, he is a member of Ra's al Ghul's the the Legion the League of Shadows mm -hmm. so he's basically a super ninja like Batman he was trained by the same guy like his he's like he's strong he's really strong and he's even more powerful just because like I said he has the same training as Batman that's why he's able to defeat him and uh so Batman best Bane in single combat. Um, it looks like Bane is about to. Bane loses. Like he, he you know grabs Bane and he goes, "Where, where is the traitor?" Yeah. Which if All right. I can so find then we got to talk if about. If I can find it, I'm totally, totally putting the audio in here. <laughs> so let's talk about let's talk about the other the the other bad guy in this movie. Tate. Miranda A.K.A. Tate. Talia. A.K.A. Talia Al Ghul. Alright, so Talia Al Ghul in the comics. Yeah. Um, I don't have much to say about her. I don't really want to talk about her that much. Let's just talk about the movie. <laughs> her character in this movie had very little to do with anything in the comic books, besides the fact that she's related to Ra's Al Ghul. Um, so Ra's Al Ghul, played by Liam Neeson, was our bad guy in the first movie. And, of course, he was our anti-society white ninja guy and yeah I have problems with that um <laughs> Talia uh basically so in the first first like two acts of the movie uh Talia is Batman's beloved basically girlfriend in the first two parts of the movie like that, that's that's yeah, his romantic it's like interest they actually in have sex it's like whoa and romance and sweet and <laughs> they like each other and, you know, they're working together, and, like, you think that they're... I honestly have to say, I was a little suspicious of her character. Yeah, they were But I didn't really think... Well, I, like, it was definitely a twist that I did not see coming. I did not think that she would be the daughter of Ra's al Ghul, for sure. That was a twist. Like, I thought she might have betrayed... Ba I thought she might have betrayed Bruce Wayne, but I didn't ever thought that she was going to be the bad guy. Well, I mean, that yeah, it turns out she's the main bad guy. They pull a Batman Begins here, and by setting up, oh, look, it's, you know, Scarecrow. He's, like, the main bad guy. Oh, JK, he's actually working for, you know, Ra's al Ghul. It's the same formulaic. Oh, yeah. look, it's Bane. He's the main bad guy. Oh, JK, he's actually working for Talia. Were you... But were you... Did you expect that? Do what? Did you expect that? No, not at all. Yeah, because you see, in the first movie, it was set Ra's al Ghul's existence was set up, like it was set up. In this movie, what happens is we're trying to discover Bane's um, origin, 
and they well Batman is his, his back is broken like during that time period in the movie we'll get we're about to talk about Batman because uh, he's a big character in this movie um we, we we here's the story about Bane he thinks it's about Bane because there's this kid he's in this prison and he finds out this kid escaped the prison and he thinks it's Bane and then he discovers that it wasn't Bane it was a girl so the story is that a mercenary went to this went to this far off land is like and um, he fell in love with the beautiful like the daughter of a general and they had ch- they you know he got her knocked up and the general exiles him and which we, was that a double for uh, Liam Neeson or was that Liam Neeson just looked no that was a, that was somebody supposed to look like Liam Neeson okay because it looked like Liam Neeson it, no. subject, it didn't and I was like it, it didn't <laughs> Um, and so Batman discovers that the, the mercenary in question was Ra's al Ghul. By the way, what happened to the, the baby of Ra's al Ghul and, and the mother was they got lowered down into the prison instead for it, instead of him. And the baby like grew up in prison. And so we're discovering the story about this baby because it was the first baby, to, <laughs> his first person to escape. We discover that it was in fact not Bane. It was uh, Bane was the, the, the child's protector, and the child was Talia, Ra's al Ghul's daughter. What a and, twist! And it was a twist. It was an effective twist. Well, I mean, it was a like, twist because she comes up and stabs Batman. It's like, and, and then twists the blade. It was like, uh oh, uh oh. I don't think anybody. I don't think anybody. I, like I said, I was a little suspicious, but I didn't think that she would be the bad guy. You know what I'm saying? That never crossed my mind for a minute. For a minute. I thought like I was I thought it was really clever to make Bane the the son of Ra's al Ghul at first. I was like, "Oh, that's cool. Nice way to tie everything together, no one." Uh, but finding out that, you know, it's Talia, I think that was even cooler to be honest. Cuz it was such a surprise twist. Um So she reveals that it was all her doing and she's the bad one and of course Batman has been working with her and so she knows everything and she knows how the neutron bomb is going to work and everything so like, well that was a that was a moment where it's like oh shit she knows how to work the bomb everything yeah she knows everything she's working the strings the whole time and so she tries to get the neutron bomb off she dies bane dies first bane dies because she tells she tells bane not to kill batman and to leave him there to die and watch his city burn and bane's like you know i have to kill you and, and then uh, Catwoman comes in and blows him the fuck away. Which yeah, is Catwoman comes with a motorcycle and shoots Bane, and he just like flies across the room. Which for me, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> Even though it was not the most satisfactory end for a villain, it was at least cool to watch. It was a well done moment. Um, it didn't look too silly or anything. It was cool. Uh, it was well timed. I'll say that for sure. I kind of I mean, like. I didn't expect him to get off right there. Um, and then Talia dies. In a Talia dies in car a. I don't, how did she die? Uh, she was in a truck. She was in a truck that fell like twenty feet face forward after being hit by a rocket. Okay. Yeah, she died. She was dead. There was no way she was gonna live through that. I was just like, I don't know. Maybe it was. I, like, was Unless she, she isn't dead. Was she dun, 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 dun. Was she like impaled or I, I don't I want I mean, to she, know exactly how she died. The point is she died. Yeah. Um so she dies and she's like, blah, Batman, suck it. <laughs> and so let's talk about Batman. Alright, so Batman. So we start off the movie and Bruce Wayne is depressed and sad and hasn't done anything in eight years really. He's lost touch with the outside world. Yeah, Bruce Wayne. Here he we go. He has a beard and he wears a robe and he has a cane because remember Joker fucked up his knees. Well, I mean that's the thing. It's like how how do you, how does one lose your cartilage in your knees? Uh, shotgun. What? Did he get shot in the knees with a shotgun? No. He got shot in the knees, or he got he got stabbed in the knees? No, or... he didn't. He, his knees his knees got screwed up really bad in the end of the Dark Knight. He fell. Maybe that's how I don't know. He, but the point is that his 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 joints got ruined in that movie. He got injured. But anyway, it's not really it's not really important how. We'll talk about that later. Let's keep talking about the story. I don't remember how exactly. I know that it did happen. 
I don't think they messed up. That's a, that's too integral to the movie to, for them to mess up that. So there has to be an explanation. Um, so after Catwoman steals his mother's pearls, he kind of gets pulled out of a shell. He yeah, having a relationship that's what with propels Talia. him. That's what pro- t- propels him literally into the plot, you know, of you know finally coming out and you know saying hello to the world. So Batman is back, and actually he kind of screws up at the beginning. He helps Bane, or more or less. How so? Remember the scene where Bane? Uh, oh, that's right. The stock yeah, he, he, they, they robbed the stock exchange, which is was a pretty good scene, especially in IMAX. Yes. Um, and Batman goes to try and chase them, and the the police are more interested in catching Batman than Bane. Which is really so Bane weird, gets away. you know, for someone who's just. Killed people and robbed. Hostages. He just stole, you know, billions of dollars potentially from the stock exchange from a, from the world. Like fucking screwed up the economy. Uh, yeah. Oh, so the other thing is, you know, uh, Wayne Industries is screwed. Pretty much. I mean, he goes completely uh, bankrupt. Broke. Yeah, he goes broke, and Alfred leaves him. That was something I did not expect because I don't, I don't, re- I don't understand it. I don't think it made sense. I think it was out of character for Alfred. I'm just throwing that did out there. Did he leave him, or did did uh, didn't Bruce say like you're fired, get out of here? No. Alfred says that he's going to leave because that's the only way that you're going to learn. Like he he says that. Like he says that this is the only way you'll understand. And I was like, Alfred would never. I mean, I guess he might have done it a couple times in the comics, but I'm saying, like, that just doesn't... That just doesn't work for me. It goes again... again, Like, I don't see how him leaving is going to help Batman. Honestly, I think he could have helped Bruce. If he had stayed... I'm just gonna... I'll just sum it up. Michael Caine did a fantastic job. I think some of the scenes with him and Alfred were fantastic in this movie. Uh, But I don't like that part of the... what, What they did with Alfred in this movie. That was, that didn't work for me. What about you? I felt like he could have been used more. I mean, he's in what three scenes total? Yeah, I mean they're all big, but I mean they're great scenes. scenes. Yeah. So he leaves. So when Alfred leaves, because he's upset that you know Bruce hasn't moved on from being Batman, or something like that. And so uh, Alfred leaves. Bruce is all alone. Uh, so he's still trying to investigate this is Talia, and he gets betrayed. So there's this, like this theme, like what is Batman? The two things is he's becoming Batman again. Do, he he's scared. He's still like he still has an issue with like connecting with people. Like think about it. Like between all three of these movies, we have like there's the times where he's Batman. And then we have eight years of him doing nothing. Yeah, I mean, was there no super villain, super villains or anything? No, it was impl- it was basically implied that like because of him getting the Joker and everything, like it just didn't it didn't really have an issue, and the cops were able to take care of it. I think the big thing is for his character is that even though Batman was a hero and everything, Bruce Wayne doesn't exist in, uh, up until this point. Because after I, I, like if any like in this movie, I think Bruce Wayne actually is important. Like he's a person, he's a character. Yeah, well, I, again, he this, this is the story of Bruce Wayne. He's fun. Yeah, he's he's fun. Like Batman, actually, I don't think Batman was as important a character in this movie as Bruce Wayne was. Does that make sense? Yeah, because I mean, how how long is it before we actually see, uh, you know, the Batman? Was it like 50, 50 minutes? Actually, I think he's Bruce Wayne through most of this movie. Well, I mean, it's like half a, a big majority half of, the film of the movie. Him recovering and him getting over the death of Rachel. I mean, he's only Batman what <sighs> three times, four times. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, and so, so he, he gets betrayed by Catwoman. He gets his back broken, and Bane sends him to the pit, the prison that he, you know, him and uh, Talia were from. And so he's Where back is broken. That he's exactly? lying there. They're keeping him alive. It's supposed to be in whatever fuck is. How did they get out there so <laughs> fast? And how did Bruce get back to, you know, to Gotham City so fast without a passport, wallet, money? He used. To, Remember, he used to be a ninja. He has ways. Okay. He remember he traveled the world for like years. He, I'm pretty sure he knows how okay, to. Okay, and here, here's here's an like issue knows I all have. the tricks. He gets back to Gotham. 
on the island, no one knows. Because he's Batman. See, and that's the only <laughs> thing I can figure out. Is it's like, well, it's Batman. And it's like, yeah, but... Yeah, he knows, He knows. like, all... Remember, his parents, like, built the yeah, city. Yeah, but no one else can get onto it. Or, or leave. So he knows... The thing is, he did, He knows how to... He knows how to get to... He knows everything about the city, so he might have, like, known about some tunnel I don't or know. Maybe an, an extended Blu-ray cut will get that, right? He has friends. Remember, like I said, like I said, he, he traveled the world for years. He probably has friends, like, all over the world that could help him. Mm, I'll roll with it. I'm just maybe. I'm just saying it's 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 yeah, very it's convenient. convenient. It's, it's kind of it's it, it it's a decent complaint. It's as decent as your complaint about like why was why did Thor know that Loki was on Earth? It's the same kind of like we don't see how it happened, but you can explain it. Mm. The reason that Thor knew that Loki was on Earth is because Loki is a they they have super science. Loki's like a god. He basically escaped prison. Yeah. Yeah. It's his brother. Like you can explain it. Like it's like why why did Loki? Because he's Thor. But it's the exact same explanation. But oh, uh, I guess yeah. Okay, you got me yeah. on that one. Yeah, it's the exact same explanation. It's and it, it's they're both legitimate in terms of a comic book. In terms of a character like that, um, so. Batman. So one of the things is the the theme with Batman in this movie, the arc for his character, as we see in prison, is is that Alfred kind of that he's suicidal. Like like after eight years, he just doesn't have anything to live for, and basically he's becoming Batman again, so he can die. Yeah, like yeah, he, he, he would be happy dying, to die Batman. as Batman, and you know that nearly happens at the end. And so what he does is he goes to the jail, and he discovers that his weakness. Is that he's afraid? Is 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 not that he's not afraid to die? His weakness is that he is not afraid to Wait, die. What? That's a weakness because it means that he doesn't have any drive. Uh, he doesn't have any okay. reason to do anything. I get you now. Well, I, you didn't get I that. Kind of got that, that was the point. That was like the whole point. That. I was just mm, okay. I did because I guess it, it, just, it, it all depends on like whether you've ever been in that kind of situation where you've been well, suicidal. It's the the difference. The the difference like the drive. It's it's. That's what I mean. I have been in that situation. The drive Thank to you. live, to want to live. Fair enough, but I'm just saying. Like, I, I'm not saying you didn't. I'm just trying to explain, like, what it, what, like, why it makes sense to me. I'm not saying you didn't have never had that experience. But the idea is that one of the strong, one of the strongest, the strongest, most basic emotion, or part of the soul, even if you want to say the soul, or if you want to call it is that drive to live willpower which is that's what batman is all about is willpower batman just batman cannot just exist to for gotham he needs to exist to exist does that make sense yeah that that's that's kind of what the point of his character arc is he needs to have the gas and the he tank. needs to have the drive which is that what that's what he discovers is that that Bane has the drive. Bane has things that he wants to... That's why Bane beat him, is because Bane had something to lose. Like, he has reasons for what he's doing. Does that make sense? Oh, do the climb without a rope. I'm sorry, I hate to say this, but if you fell from that distance and landed on a rope you around die. your back... That's what I thought. It's like, it kills people. Yeah, but here's the, you know, here's the other thing. Kills I, knew that the, I knew that the reason he didn't make the climb the very first time was because of the rope. So the so okay so to get out of the pit so he starts healing his back and the way to get out of the pit is and everybody can try it. The thing about the prison is that the, the whole idea is that it, it takes away all your hope because there's a way out and you can attempt to get out but no one besides you think it's Bane and then it turns out it's Tali has ever escaped and it's that you can climb out basically it's at the bottom of this huge well is where the prison is it's basically what think of that image the image like a giant well. And the, you can climb up it with these rocks that are on the walls. And to get to the very top, you have to make this jump. That's it. It's, it seems like basically it's an impossible jump. That's basically that's what ruins it every time. You're ti- usually you're tired and exhausted by when you get there. And they have this rope. And then Batman, or sorry, Batman, Bruce Wayne realizes. I think the old man tells him it's the rope, right? Yeah, he says, you know, if you want to really make it, try it Because it's rope. a safety rope. Because if you fell, you would die. But the rope saves you. Yeah. 
Somehow. I don't know how. But it does. Because the rope represents the fear. It's the safety net. It's the... That, that's why they fail. And, I mean, literally okay. it fails because it's, it's, a phys- it's physically holding you back. Um, and so he, we, he climbs without the rope and he escapes. And he, you know, lets down the rope so everyone else can escape. I think is what happens at the end. Kind of. That's kind of implied. I don't know. I don't know. And so, after he escapes that, so now he's, he's, he had, he realizes, you know, that that's, that's what he has, he has to want to live. He has to, and the reason he wants to live, of course, is for his city, but it's that he wants to live. Because there will always be somebody that needs him and needs Batman. Right? Yeah. That's the idea. Is that, is that, I think part of it is that he became depressed because he kind of felt like Batman became everything he was and he felt like Batman wasn't needed. Does that make sense? He, of course, it was part of it was the tip-off was, you know, the Richard, the Rachel Daw thing. But yeah, so Batman comes back, he's got this new drive. Rachel Dawes. He wants to live. He wants Gotham to live. And so Batman comes back. This is my city. He defeats Bane. He, you know, he get he convinces Catwoman to help him. He defeats Talia. He's, he, and all he has to do is get... It's kind of obvious what was going to happen, right? That he was going to have well, to, like, yeah, fly the bomb yeah. off. It, it was, it was, you know, it was spoiled by the trailers, and it was, you know... But! I mean, everybody knew it was going to happen. But here's the question. Did you think that no one was going to kill Batman? No. I, 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 I neither. honestly thought about From the it. moment, you know what it was? The moment they mentioned the autopilot, I already knew that that was going to really? play into it. Yes. See, the funny thing is, I forgot about that. Because no one... Here's the thing. This is why I was talking about earlier when, like, I watch movies. I pick out so many... I pick every little... This is also why I'm really good at D&D is because little details that most people would normally not notice, I like notice. over, like Because no, no good writer would ever mention anything for no reason. There's no... Like, well, a good writer never does anything for no reason. Well, Otherwise, it'd not, just be a red herring. It's it's not the you know they didn't mention it for any reason. I just forgot about. it. They mentioned it twice. Twice. Yeah. I mean, no one would. Know, yeah, he mentioned because it, it first happens when he first hears about the ship. Morgan Freeman's character says the autopilot doesn't work. Oh, and that's right. And they're like, oh, don't you have autopilot? And yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah, he, that happens twice exactly. So and it, I was like, ah, blah blah. blah. <laughs> I already knew it well, was. I, mean, I knew what? that I knew that Batman was going to escape through autopilot, and that's what happens. He. Then why didn't he tell Gordon, yeah, there's an autopilot? Because he didn't, because I think in the idea is that he wanted to, quote unquote, die so he could live. I don't know. Maybe it's only temporary. He'll come back. I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that in the sequel that will never happen. Maybe it will. Maybe there will be a comic book about it. I doubt it. it. You're not That's getting That's actually Chris very Nolan. likely. Or a, oh, I'd say a comic book sequel to the series is extremely likely. I mean, a comic sequel, yeah, but a, a movie sequel, hell no. Or at least with no Nolan. And without any Nolan, you can almost say I don't, you know, There are other competent film directors out there. (laughs) They exist. Yeah, let's get Zack Snyder. Let's not talk about that. Um, (laughs) You obviously, I I don't want to get in an argument. Um, So, yeah. So, that's the end of our film is, 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 you know, Batman... Uh, was willing to sacrifice himself to save the day, but he doesn't because he doesn't have to. Because he wants to live. Because he's the hero Gotham deserves. So they detonate the neutron bomb away from the city. And, but not the one it needs right now. And he leaves, and Catwoman leaves with him. So there's the scene where Alfred sees him and Catwoman together, or Selena Kyle together. And, you know, it's kind of a happy ending there. Blake quits quits the force. Because the whole point, one of the other themes of the movie was that structures hold you back a lot of the time. Yeah. Which really, that is a, that is like one of, supposed to be one of the ideas behind Batman is that he does, he's, he's a vigilante, right? Yeah, he, he's the guy that can do what some men never could do. And, and he was the, the, the yeah, more the shining light. Yeah, the, the more mundane way to say it is it kind of ties back to the thing I said with Gordon, which is that... Basically, if you can do something that's if you can do something to help people, you should. And that mm-hmm. and that a lot of the times you don't need to do that within like a system, like within a 
Like a lot of people think that like to be a good person, you have to like donate your time to charity or donate your time to like you know what I'm saying like through an organization. Yeah, but, but sometimes uh, all it is is like going over to your neighbor's house and like making sure they're okay during a storm or something like that. Oh yeah, it's, that's what constitutes a good person as well. Yeah, that, that's that's one of the themes of the movies. You don't have to be Batman to be a hero, to be a good person. But if you can, you should. <laughs> yeah. So, so Maybe. In, you know, so while wrapping up here, uh, what is your favorite moment uh, from this film and least favorite moment? My very favorite moment from this film... <sighs> the moment that was probably the, the best for me was either... I, I, I mean, I'm, like, if I had to say one scene that was just really well done, it would probably be... I loved all the scenes with Bane in him. I'm just going to say. Bane was probably my favorite part of the movie. I was really impressed that they pulled it off. He's not one of my favorite. He's really he's become really popular recently in the comic books and over time. Mm-hmm. But he's never really been one of my favorite of the uh, of the Batman stable. But I think they pulled him off really well in the movie. So he's probably my... Like I, instead of a moment, because there are a lot of good moments and I have to watch the movie again if I really wanted to pick one out. I would say it was him. My least favorite moment, as I said, was kind of like what they did with Robin. I think they did an okay job. No, actually, it's Alfred. It's Alfred leaving. There's my least favorite moment. There, your turn. For me, it's basically like the last 25, 35 minutes of, you know, the last final fight. I don't think I've ever... I mean, that was intense. That was yes. just very well the, put the, together. With the cops, and they, they all get shot. With, with, with the cops, and oh, uh, everyone so fighting. Awesome Batman comes out, fights Bane. You got the chase of you know Batman being in the bat, chasing Miranda Tate, and, and the bomb, and, and Gordon's trying to disarm it. I mean, that was that was just amazing. Uh, least favorite moment. Um, I'm probably gonna go with the. Uh, um, I'm thinking. What which character did you like the least? Uh, the character of Miranda Tate. I know you didn't like Daggert. Oh, okay. I'll say that. Uh, probably would be uh, any scene with Daggert or, you know, the scene where Bane comes in and kills him off. I don't know why, but they do. It just kills him yeah. off. Well, good blah, blah, blah. You're not useful anymore. Yeah. And that was, once again, it was supposed to imply that, that he, like, because you could kind of think that maybe Daggert, like, Bane is just, you know... Under Daggard's thumb, but it instantly... Yeah, no. Bane, Bane is nobody's dog. I also was not a fan of the bar room, bar scene, slash... You think just because you give him money that you have control over me? That was part of the theme, though. Mm, yeah, but... Was the idea was that it, just because you have money doesn't mean that you should have power. Okay, well, maybe in a second viewing that'll be more sense. For the first viewing, it definitely was not my favorite. I also didn't like the bar scene uh, with Anne Hathaway, mostly only because the editing... It, it was kind of muggy. It was very muggy, and that was all in IMAX, too. So it, it was uh, that entire scene and the uh, explosion and you know sewer subsequent scenes were in IMAX as well. And that on an AFIT screen was very, very, uh, you know, callback to Batman Begins. I can't tell what's going on. I mean, I was realizing people were getting shot. There, there was some hand-to-hand. Are you talking about the sewer scene where, like, Gordon no, no, no. first the, gets caught? Mostly, or are talking about the... the bar scene and the chase into the sewers. Yeah. But once it got, got into the sewers, saying, yeah. it was fine. Gotcha. It was just that period, that, you know, four minutes or three minutes. I got you, man. I got you. Maybe, that makes sense. Maybe that was, seeing that was it kind of confusingly reg- shot. Yeah, maybe seeing it in regular 35 will be a little bit better. Uh, but in IMAX, it was just a mess. That was my one complaint. It was a little complaint. hard to t- tell what was going on. I yeah, agree. also, other complaints, the music and sound design sometimes got in the way of the dialogue. I'm, I'm just going to say this. Um, Hans Zimmer uh, is... is, is, is uh, yeah. It was a fantastic score. He's, he's competent. It was a fantastic score. Uh, <sighs> I'm not a big fan of Hans okay, Zimmer. Okay, well, well, I just, you know... Give me... Um, here's what I'll say. Com- can you honestly can you honestly say that the Hans Zimmer Batman theme sounds like Batman? Or does it just sound like any other Hans Zimmer theme that's in a Christopher Nolan? I movie? mean, if you if you want to go if you, you want to say that cuz cuz here's the thing, for me the Danny Elfman Batman theme is the most iconic Batman theme. Oh yeah, it, it's I'm saying it's a great theme. 
I also and, love and the I think Hans Danny Zimmer Elfman team. just does the score better just because he's Danny Elfman. And Danny Elfman, here's the thing: Danny Elfman has his own tropes and things he does too. But I think he's more unique. Yeah, I've made fun of it before too. But it, to me, it's a little more unique. There's a lot more variety with Hans Zimmer. It's always. <laughs> no matter what movie he's in, like he did the theme for the Sherlock Holmes movie too, and it was the same way. That makes like you can even make fun of John Williams theme. Yeah, you can definitely can. I'm not a big fan of Hans Zimmer's score. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it's competent. It works. I'm not saying it's distracting or anything, but. It, it's not it, it for me. It's not one of the main draws of the Nolan trilogy. For me, I listened to the score twice, and I actually listened to it while recording here. Um, the first time listening to it was uh, pre-film, and mm-hmm. I thought, you know, you got the Catwoman theme, you got the Batman theme, you got the Bruce Wayne theme. Yes, there is a difference, and you got the Bane theme, and and then everything else was kind of like noise. Uh, That's kind of what I'm in, but. <laughs> then listening to it post film, it's like, oh, well, this is where that happens, and that's where that happens, and you know, I, I did find, you know, still a lot of it was noise, but it was, you know, it was a lot easier to listen to for some reason. I mean, for me, the main draw of the film is that I, th- I think the main draw of the trilogy, if anything, is that no one has matured, has managed to make a mature film about a superhero character, about a comic book character. Make three of them. That is, it's it. It doesn't talk down to anyone. It has lots of really smart ideas. Like, there's a lot of there's a lot. Like, I'd say like I want to go back and watch all three movies so I can get the whole picture. Yeah, like a marathon. But I don't know if I could do a and, seven. Yeah, and like half. analyze it and be like, okay, now like how do the themes of the first movie fit into the themes of the third movie and so on? You know, back and forth. Yeah, between the, does all three it make movies. sense consecutively? Because they, they yes. borrow Do more they all from Batman together Begins into a, into a cogent mythology. They borrow more from Batman Begins than they do from Dark Knight. I agree. No, it's, it's, I mean, it's a fact. I, that's, that's definitely true. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I think... I, would, I, would, I have no problem saying that this movie was better than Batman Begins... Um, I don't, I'm not sure if it was better than The Dark Knight, but I, I, that remains to be seen for me. It's, they're two very different kinds of films, just because of the kind of story they're telling. As I, I kind of said during the review, there were a few things they did better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like the, the, the way that Bruce Wayne was handled. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Um, but sometimes, like I said, the other thing is there was a lot of plots going on at once in this movie. I feel like in in the Dark Knight there were only like two or three. You could argue there like three threads in that movie. Well, you got maybe. you got the Batman one, you got the Harvey Dent one, and then you got Harvey Commissioner Dent one Gordon and the one. Joker one. And then the, the the connection between the Joker, the, the the Batman and the Harvey Dent is of course the Rachel yeah. Dawes character. But yeah, those are yeah those are your three. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that does make sense. Is that Gordon and Gordon and Richard Rachel Dawes kind of are the characters that tie all those three threads together. That makes sense. It actually does make sense. But yeah, so yeah. Um, I think it remains to be seen. I'd have to watch these two films, you know, kind of... I'd have to watch this film again. Yeah, I am, but I am it's definitely, definitely looking film. forward to my next viewing of it, which I know will happen within the next week. Awesome. Um, I, you know, if anybody who reads my blog is interested in what I would give it um, on, a, on my five scale, it is a five out of For five me, film. Right now, that's for my me, gut right now, it is a very good nine point five. There are some issues with it, like Bane's death and um, some inconsistencies that may be cleared up on a second viewing, uh, like sound design. Maybe that's you know my theater I was in. I'm not sure. Well, no, no, yeah. Don't get me wrong. There, for me, a five out of five doesn't mean the film is perfect. It just means it's a. Really well, on good my idea. scale, good sir, a ten out of ten means a film is a perfect film. Well, f- well, five isn't necessarily. Well, a 10 I out was 10. saying on <laughs> my scale. Thank you very much. And <laughs> see, it's not a yeah, but it's for yeah. If you want to use a really like. Well, yeah, scale. this is anyway. a nine point five out of ten. <laughs> Batman begins to be probably an eight out of ten, Argue. and then Dark Knight. So yeah, not, so you're giving it a nine point five out of ten. I'm giving it a five out of five. Yes, I'm splitting hairs. Damn it! 
So everybody yeah, go see this I mean, this there's movie. no reason you shouldn't see this film. Uh, unless you're not a fan of Batman, you're more of a Superman fag. Or haven't seen the first two films. Well, I mean, arguably, you could. I mean, I, I feel sorry for you if you did go into this film without the knowledge. I'm, I, I will say this. Um, I really don't think this is a film for no. children. Um, or little kids. So Stay, if you have any, take, take them home. If you know anybody who has any, and they're thinking about taking them to this movie, be considerate of your other th- theater patrons. This is a very loud yeah, it movie. Very it's a very loud. violent movie. Um, I would definitely say this is a film you would you should leave the kids with a sitter. I mean, yeah, or ten like ten is pushing it. Eleven, twelve, maybe thirteen and up. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that br- don't please. I mean, you can obviously gauge your, your your kids, but I'm just saying, like, little like at my theater, um, there were there was an infant, and I was just like, this movie's too loud for them. I mean, for an my infant. theater, there was a five year old, and they couldn't shut up. So, hooray! Yeah, there were there were some little kids talking behind. Me. There were some little kids behind me in the movie, but they were mostly well behaved. I just, ugh. Uh, ugh. like this is not the, like this like I don't know. But that that's that's pretty much it, folks. Um, what did you think about the film? If, what did you if think you're about an the adult, film? Leave a comment. Uh, leave a comment on this web zone. Yeah, leave it. Leave if it on you, this uh, YouTube. If, you if, if you leave a comment on this web zone, like and subscribe. I'll send you a pizza roll. <laughs> if you leave a comment on this YouTube video, I guarantee you, I will reply to it, no matter how silly or stupid yeah, the comment is. Because, uh, we we need uh, we need some feedback, people. We 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 want to know how we're doing. <laughs> you know. Yep. And yeah, yep yep yep. But uh yeah, folks. Uh, that's pretty much it. I think that's where we'll wrap it up. Uh, I think we've pretty much summed up our feelings about this great film. So Sean, where can um, we find you? Until next time. Uh, don't go silently into that. Uh, well, where can we night. find you then? Oh, well, you can find me on dumbledoreshotfirst.blogspot.com. Okay. And you can find me on Facebook if you can actually find my profile. And you can find me on this podcast and the Fabrish Factor podcast. We just recorded a uh, Batman Begins Dark Knight podcast not three days ago. And you can also find me on YouTube, Space Mountaineer 91, which is probably where you're finding this anyway. And you can also find me on uh, Sanity of a College Student dot blogspot.com there you go folks uh, and that'll that'll be all he's the hero Gotham deserves but not the one he needs right now you have permission to end this podcast when this podcast tell me is where the ashes. detonators are anyway then you can end <laughs> my permission to die alright uh, I'm gonna stop. hit stop okay alright <laughs>